This is Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel, bringing you a program devoted to painting and drawing from life. I bring the subject matter into the studio, sometimes people, and we also bring scenes into the studio by going out and taking videotapes of the scene that I'd like to paint and bringing it here and I work from a monitor. It's an inno innovative approach to this kind of instruction on television. And I think probably very valuable at, uh, at the same time, especially if people have their own videotapes, uh, video machines. They can go out and videotape their scenes, come back and project them on their screens and work from there, just like I'm doing now. So uh, it's, of course, a local origination, and uh, the crew went up and took a uh, long tape of the Setauket Harbor, which is the scene that I'm going to be working on today. Behind me, of course, are homegrown Long Island Iris and um, a number of other beautiful homegrown things that I always do because I believe in painting what I am familiar with in my own surroundings. So there is my monitor uh, that is the subject matter is if I were looking out of a window. It's live. Uh, there are birds flying that can tell you that there is motion and that I'm not working from a still photograph or a poster or such uh, such kind of things. So the Setauket Harbor in the wintertime is virtually colorless, except, of course, for the wonderful blue reflection of the sky. Uh, there are things missing, namely boats and so on. But um, that is the subject that one has in the winter, and that's what you work with. And so when you have, uh, when you have a lacking for something, you try to make up for it some other way. I'm going to start laying it out with my liner brush, which is what I use instead of charcoal, because I disapprove of charcoal, it mud muddies up the paint. So I use a brush with uh, tinted turpentine. Uh, the tinting is sometimes black, sometimes Prussian blue, sometimes brown, but nevertheless, any kind of color that is dark. I'm working on a grayed canvas because white is much too brilliant. And so this, this little prepared canvas is rather small. You can tell by the you know, relationship to my hand how small it is, 11 by 14. And I'm going to start to lay it out the way I do to try to give you some idea of how you begin all this thing. And the horizon line is the first thing that you find. If you have a steady hand, which mine sometimes is not as steady as I like it to be, but indicate some kind of a horizon line running across the canvas. Um, uh, the, uh, the layout is part of the plan. You have to have a plan in order to do anything, and painting is no exception. Here is the general outline of the shoreline, which I'm going to be working with, and that means I have a two-line composition so far. Uh, a third line is going to be coming in with the land mass, which is in the, in the distance, and this is called uh, Strong's Neck. And over here is Pukwat. In case anybody knows this area, that's, I'm, I'm identifying it for the people who just may know the area. And if you don't, you can go up and uh, look, check it out and see how quite beautiful all of these areas are in our, in our vicinity of Long Island. And um, you'll find that you don't have to go far afield to, to, to distant lands in order to be able to get paintable subjects. Now, I think, I, I think that while I've been talking, I have probably put in no more than five lines. The foreground line, this is called the middle ground. This is becoming the distant uh, ground, uh, distant middle ground, and of course the background is the sky and whatever is beyond that visible or not visible. Whatever details take place in the middle here, such as this uh, dock, which is now in winter doldrums, it has not got its um, ladder running down, which comes this way. I'm going to put it in just to show you what, uh, how nice angles can work. And then there's an elevated dock here, a uh, high dock here with its pilings. 
And this, of course, is floating in the water. In the summertime, this entire area is absolutely covered with boats, but there are enough to make it interesting today. An old fishing trawler is over here, an old clamming boat is over here, which, is, which will disappear uh, in the painting of this, so, but I'm just indicating it to give you some idea of how you lay these things out and how your plans can take shape with very simple amount of observation. There is a line in the foreground here of something, a sunken piece of lumber of, of some sort, which is a very uh, important if you can find these places. This leads the eye into the picture. In the foreground here we've got all of these uh, details of rocks and so forth that, which we'll get to as we work our way towards the foreground. But all of this is part of the plan. And if you do find an area where a place where there is an angle it's called a leading angle, leading, your, leading the viewer's eye right into the picture. So you get a three-dimensional effect that way. Uh, this is just about all that you would probably need in, in the way of a layout plan to do a landscape no matter how large or how small. Um, the simpler you keep it, the better. And the details come in a good deal later. After the majority of the painting has been done, the details come in. So let me get to... Uh, uh, going on the business of doing the background. Now, I like to mix colors many times with a palette knife because it keep mix, it mixes them evenly and very quickly as opposed to, uh, you know, little tiny bits at a time. So I'm using my palette here. This is a palette that I use, that I use for a, a, another program and it uh, just needs to be cleaned with my palette knife. Uh, supplies are expensive, even though this is just another canvas, um, uh, uh, canvas board. Um, I believe that one should be as economical as possible with materials and supplies, and that's why I don't use 65 and $75 pallets made out of mahogany. I think that it's uh, always important to have economy in the back of the mind because the paints are very expensive. And if a flat surface such as this will do, then why, why not save the money and buy it for paints? So, um, I'm mixing the uh, the color of uh, the the sky, which may be transmitted a little bit harsh colors. The colors are not that harsh and brilliant in the winter time. However, uh, when you go out and tape with a, with an electronic device, you find that uh, sometimes the colors have been altered. Um, I, f I find that the uh, skies are usually much too intense on the uh, on the monitor. So I subdue them a little bit when I'm working from this. And if you anybody decides to work from a monitor, it's a good idea to check it out, uh, check the scene out uh, with your own uh, remembrance of the color and say, well, it's just too dark on the monitor, so I'm going to lighten it a bit. This is a, um, this is a way that I can put the sky on with the knife, and then I'm going to use a brush technique. This is another technique which I have delved in sometimes, but uh, this is important when you're out there in the field, especially when the weather is not as friendly as it might be, and you want to get something done quickly, you can, in fact, put paint on a large surface uh, quickly, not for speed. I mean, the business of painting a picture in a half an hour is not my thing. It's the speed that you're doing because you're, try you're fighting the elements or and or the changing position of the sun. So if I can put a, um, a quick background color or anywhere, and then if I use a brush to smooth it out with a brush, uh, afterwards, after I have applied the paint, it's a technique which uh, is used quite often, but I don't think it's shown very often to people. It's either knife or brush. I combine both for, for reasons of, of, uh, of uh, economy of time. So, and I want to also now lighten the sky as it goes towards the horizon, which I'm doing by some more white, some manganese blue, which is a wonderful color to have. It, you can use it sparingly. It's quite expensive, but um, it's vital when you want to use uh, um, a beautiful brilliance of, 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 uh, of a certain type of blue. Manganese and cerulean blue are, ve are very important in a palette. Uh, so I'm applying the paler color down near the horizon here with the, um, with the knife, and I will show you how you blend, blend it with a brush. When it's all when it's all on, and you can see the rapidity with which one can work when you're using uh, a knife as opposed to to a small brush. I don't use wide brushes. I think the deliberate strokes are much more painterly and much more much more effective in the long run. So I don't use great big wide brushes to go do great big sweeping um, um, areas. Uh, that's I, I reserve that for my living room walls. Uh, 
I don't do it on my canvases. So as you can see, I always use very small, deliberate strokes. Well, I have the paint on, and now I'm going to take a uh, square cut sable brush. Oh, well, no, I won't do that. I'm going to take this one. Uh, excuse me for one moment. Yes, I think I'll take this one, and I will now uh, not just remove, but refine the application of the paint that I put on with the knife. A close-up will be able to show you how the uh, brush strokes uh, appear as I'm simply um, blending the knife application into a brush technique. The, um, it's, it, it's very effective. You can, get, you can still get the nice texture, but you still also get uh, the brush. Um, as you, maybe you can hear the little dabbing sounds. This is the way I believe paint should be applied uh, at all times in small, deliberate strokes. Not necessarily all in the same direction either. They can, they can go. And if you study the masters, you will see that brush strokes, even though they worked very smooth, the brush strokes do not always simply go across like house painting. They are deliberately put on with small, very studied strokes. All right. Well, we've gotten the um, we've gotten the uh, the furthest part of this scene recorded. Uh, well, I, I would like to probably do well. I'll find it in a moment. Um, I'd like to do the the next uh, area, which is far away, but getting progressively closer. So once again, with the with the uh, knowledge that colors in the winter time are extremely subdued. Um, and they uh, tend to be almost colorless, but they aren't. Uh, the, the, the monitor can tell you that there is no, it's not colorless out there, but it isn't the flamboyance of spring or summer or fall. So there is a lovely sort of subtle, um, I'm using some, a subtle color to the, to the distance here. I'm using a, um, a uh, sap green, it's called, Mr. Grumbacher puts out sap green, a base of uh, some white, a touch of, mauve or a spectrum violet and remembering that all things in the distance are paler because of atmosphere the uh, meaning that you must save the dark colors for when you come closer to the viewer um, the disney cartoons will be able to tell you that uh, if you if you can um, to, you know, gear your thoughts away from the cartoon story and look and see what they do with the background, you will see that there is a classic painting technique in the backgrounds of the Disney films, of, of all cartooning films, with color and atmosphere and distance and things in the foreground are, are not only darker but they're also fuzzy around the edges because focus. Um, a, a great deal to be learned by something as innocent seeming as a um, as an animated cartoon. The uh, uh, artists are the ones who are involved with the production of animated cartoons, and fine arts painting is absolutely uh, visible in all of those things. So, um, uh, I, you know, having worked uh, at Disney's myself, I know whereof I speak, and I know that uh, the it's information which is to be, you know, passed on, even in case people just think that cartoons just sort of happen. There's a tremendous amount of classic uh, painting background in um, in animated cartoons. And when little children come to me and, and ap almost apologetically say, I want to be a cartoonist, I, I jump with enthusiasm because um, it's, a, it's a remarkable field to be in, full of very hidden uh, artistic endeavors and disciplines. So I don't know how I got off on that, but I'm now working on the distant shoreline. The paint can be put on a little bit thinner here, uh, thicker here. It does not have to be smoothed out. And uh, because I want some brilliance, the sun is hitting this shoreline back there and I would like, um, I want to see some brilliance. And so you can in fact um, apply paint rather thickly when you're back here. It gives, a, it gives a texture, which is what oil paints are all about. Uh, watercolors have no texture. They have to rely entirely on their watery uh, quality in order to have um, the interest going. But in oils, the uh, interest tends to be very much with the texture. Um, that's why smooth oils uh, from the uh, old times have a, a date attached to them. You know that very, very smooth painting is a dated thing. It's the Impressionists that came along with the use of heavy, heavily applied paint, which is called impasto. Um, it's, that's an Italian word for applied thickly. So 
Um, uh, using the uh, using the uh, uh, probably the only available colors in this scene out there uh, right now, I'm putting this on. It's, it may appear to be rather impressionistic, but when you're dealing with things that are in the great distance, uh, you don't concentrate on the details. You concentrate on the the flavor of it or the general atmosphere of it. And here we have uh, a great atmosphere because it's, well, it's a bright, clear day, but it's also winter time. And a lot of things happen in the environment in the winter time that make it wintry looking. Namely, there is, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, frozen stuff out there, which is, tends to be amber colored. That's probably the, one of the few places where you'll find any color at all in the winter is in the, in the foliage that has uh, faded and or died. Well, I've got three bands of color, actually, in this piece now. I have the sky and the distant greens uh, and the shoreline of the faraway middle ground. And uh, beginning to work forward, I'm going to start to mix, and I'm using my Marage medium to get the color to flow very quickly because I, uh, I, I want to be able to cover this distance in, uh, in paint as quickly as possible because, well, we're limited. We, uh, we, we work on a time, uh, time limit. Now, these colors are a touch of Prussian blue, a good deal of ultramarine, some orange to subdue the blue so that it isn't as brilliant as it, uh, as it is from the tube, and uh, it's being applied in, in small and deliberate strokes, paying attention to the fact that the water in the distance is much darker than it is in the middle ground. So I'm going to, I'm going to put a, a touch of Prussian, a pure Prussian blue back there against the shoreline, and it's going to make the shoreline appear even more brilliant than it is uh, with that pure uh, pale color that I put on. The minute you get a dark color on, the pale one is going to, is going to stand out even more. Uh, there are many people who say to me, well, working from life is so hard, and and I get confused. Well, actually, working from li life is, is, is easier because it's all there. You don't have to guess at anything. And the programs that have people working out of their imagination do not address the business of, uh, it is so much more difficult to work out of the imagination because the human mind and memory does not have instant recall unless you're a particularly, unless, it, unless that's a gift that has been given to you. But um, for the most part, people need to be able to look and uh, remind themselves of what they're seeing, and that can only happen when you work from life. The application of this paint is being done in small strokes. There is a variety of color. Some, some of it becomes light and some of it becomes less light because of the play of light on the water. Also, as you can see, I'm going right over the layout for where that floating dock is because uh, there's no need for me to retain it. I know, I know where it is, and it's there in front of me for me to be able to go back and remind me of where it is. So when you work from subject matter, you're able to, um, you're able to refer back and forth. That's why painters look back and forth at what they're doing. Uh, I find that uh, a lot of the business of working from life is being ignored and uh, is being minimized when actually it is of vital importance to get what I call classic good painting done. So uh, I think I'm going to take a small break here because I do need to find a particular brush and I'll be back in just a moment so don't leave me. I'll go through my belongings and see if I find my brush.
Well, here we are back again. I found the brush. Everything is fine. Nothing, no panic. And I'm uh, working now towards the foreground of this body of water, which uh, anybody who's been watching knows is Setauket Harbor in the wintertime. Uh, still just as, as wonderful in a different way as it is in the summer. Uh, and the spring and the fall. All of these areas uh, within uh, the local uh, viewing area are uh, paintable, paintable places, and so the need to go far afield or to copy anything out of the National Geographic that may have a story on Cambodia is, 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 not, is not necessary because you've got it all here for you to work on in, uh, well, as the song says, in your own backyard. Um, I'm going to deal with this uh, pale area in the foreground here, which makes a water painting uh, luminous. When you find, when you're lucky enough to find an area of water that has got a lovely pale glow to it because of whatever is happening in the atmosphere, that's to be taken advantage of. And it's usually something to do with the uh, disturbance of the water surface. Whatever it is, uh, I always take great advantage of those, of those nice things that happen, um, not quite by accident, but certainly arbitrarily out there in the so-called wild. Um, I think that when we get some close-ups on this particular scene, which is what happens when the crew goes out and uh, close-ups come into play, because I need to talk about things that you see more closely, uh, there are some rather remarkable nature uh, shots, which I think that uh, everybody is going to be really intrigued with, something that you don't see very often. And so when that time comes, you see there is a, there's a, uh, the monitor just uh, showed us um, uh, the fact that we are working from something live with a little flock of some very agitated ducks out there. And there are all kinds of uh, wonderful uh, birds, uh, bird life, and all sorts of other types of life that live by the water's edge. I believe there's a crane and uh, certainly seagulls. But here is the general way that you would... Um, uh, you know, all of these, all of these things are there for you to record as quickly as possible. There seems to be a low tide disturbance here in a strange kind of pattern, which um, I'm going to just merely interpret. It, uh, it's happening probably because of the mud flats that are here in the uh, where it's near the shore, and it's um, it's all there on the monitor, and I find that it's 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 quite wonderful. It gives a it gives an un, unexpected texture to the water in the foreground, which is obviously now getting quite low and hitting the, gr and, and you know, sort of lapping up against the, um, the sides of the, uh, of the shoreline. So all of these, all of these um, uh, patterns, which are simply not able to be remembered uh, in just arbitrarily by saying, I'm going to do a beach scene. I would never in the, my wildest dreams be able to figure that the low tide was going to do this to the, um, to the water. So here is where the water meets the land. I'm going to mix now some Indian red, which is uh, vital on my palette, and be able to see if I can get the, the quality color and blend it into the low water of the tides uh, in this manner. It, it blends rather mysteriously. You don't really know where one begins and the other one ends. So. Uh, that's what I'm paying attention to because of the water being transparent and it's now low enough to be able to see uh, the uh, land through it or the mud flats, uh, be, be that whatever it may be. And here are some details which uh, I'm going to leave the angle that I laid out so that we don't, we don't lose it. Uh, I could lose the other one, the boat and so forth, because it's right out there. But if the water comes up, I will suddenly lose the angle that I sketched, because that's we're dealing with time out there. And if the water were to come up, I would lose the angle of that, of that f sunken log or whatever it may be that's giving me the detail, the, um, the angle. So the um, shoreline is getting progressively darker as it comes near me, which means some more Indian red. I'm using some Marage medium to make this flow more quickly. And uh, the rocks can be laid on top of the, um, I'm actually preparing a background for the, the shoreline by, uh, by just putting in a solid color. And then after that, you, um, you use that very much like the sky is the background for the trees in the distance. And so uh, as I'm applying this darker tone, making it meet the water, it blends as, it go as you go along. 
Um, and, uh, in a moment, I'm going to, I've been using a number uh, six uh, square cut red sable brush, which I find is uh, a very good all-purpose brush. And with the exception possibly of every once in a while, my liner brush for very small details and maybe a, sm a fan brush to smooth out certain rough areas, that's about this, the number. So I have three brushes and my, the, the sheet that I have put out as instructions of what to buy if you're going to start painting has uh, three to five brushes uh, that you need to buy and brushes are expensive so you'd keep the purchase of those at a minimum. I'm going to start to, I'm going to lay out now, though I don't have much time left, I'm going to do this program of Satorkit Harbor in two segments. This is the first one which is a sort of a preliminary of how you work in the details. Uh, we've got the preliminaries uh, pretty much set and now in order to make this something more than just a color layout of uh, a few different bands uh, a lot of people would say well that's enough don't do any more but we're, we're dealing now here with having to to work from life and see details and 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 make them work for you in the composition this is all probably um, you know it's okay for the for the color values and so on but now what makes it interesting is the uh, is the presence of human habitation namely what it is that human beings do to an environment and that's what is uh, that's what is called landscape painting that includes people always has uh, I'm going to indicate here, as I uh, as the time begins to wear out, where that floating dock is, just by giving you a layout in the middle of this um, of this water uh, this middle water area, and. Uh, there is a f uh, there is a way of getting down to this floating dock in in the season, and even though it isn't here, and I'm kind of negating my desire to work only from life and only from what you see, um, I must tell you that for composition, the, you'd have to have the access to the dock. Um, available to make it an interesting composition. So I'm going to I'm going to show you. Uh, I would go back uh, when this when this access to the dock uh, returns in the season. Everything is closed down now. But when it returns in the season, the angle is usually this. It comes. It makes for the the break between all of these horizontals to have this angle, which is going to complement this one. That is what I'm. That is what I wanted to. I want to point out to you. Uh, in this uh, final few moments of this program, and then when you tune in the next time for the final of the um, of the composition of Satorkit Harbor, we'll talk about more. Well, I hope you got something out of this first session. Satorkit Harbor will be completed the next time. Thanks for watching, and this is Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel, hoping you got something out of it, and uh, go out there and paint your environment. It's very beautiful. Bye-bye. <laughs>